how should a wife treat her husband and how should a husband treat his wife and it's partly you don't put your partner down in public why well it's not because you're hurting that person's feelings that's not why it's that you're denigrating the relationship that you are in voluntarily when i've some of the most painful days i've ever spent one in particular i spent with a group of men who had been in therapy for their marriage and who bloody well needed it i can tell you that and they spent their whole day complaining about their wives like it just made me sweat the whole day i thought i can't believe i'm here with you guys and how can you be so damn dumb it's certainly possible that you married barbarian witches fine you're so lacking in sense that you would discuss that in public not noticing that you picked them so basically all you're doing is holding up a sign and waving it constantly that says i'm an idiot you have a responsibility to those whom you love and are obligated to to ensure that they manifest themselves in a manner that's most beneficial to them over the long run now you have the same responsibility i would say to yourself but you'll have blind spots other people have to help you with that but so the rule is you help your wife figure out how not to make a fool of herself in public and she extends to you the same courtesy and it's partly maintenance of the sacred nature of the relationship it has nothing to do with you or her precisely it's broader and wider than that now it's two levels of responsibility child partner next level of responsibility <clears throat> what the egyptian story says osiris is overcome by seth because he's willfully blind willfully blind which means he knows but refuses to he knows, quote, his predator detection systems have gone off. Monster. Well, then you're supposed to look, okay, exactly what sort of monster is this? Well, it doesn't have wings, it doesn't have a tail. You cut it from the monster that it could be into the monster that it is. That's the first step. And then you take the appropriate steps. And then you also notice the other monsters, because here's something to think about. You're going to pay a price for speaking up. But you're going to pay a price for not speaking up. So it's like... Monsters on the right, monsters on the left. Pick the ones you want to battle with. If you decide not to make your stand, you weaken yourself. If you do it a hundred times, then even if the monster was only this big, now you're this big, it's going to eat you. When it was this big, you probably could have kicked it across the room. It's too late for that. You've capitulated and capitulated. What you've done, and this is a way to think about it from a Jungian perspective, this is what Jung was trying to get at when he was talking about alchemy. It's like the thing that pops up to object to you is this incredibly complex entity. It's the entire world encapsulated in the event. If you interact with it, you unpack it. You differentiate your sense of the world. You gather new skills. Let's say we're having a conversation and it's flowing melodically and all of a sudden I say something and there's a disjunction, right? You're offended by it. There's some negative emotion that comes up. Maybe I've said something to impress you or to be arrogant and you respond badly. It's like you've got this melodic thing going on. It's a consensual frame and something pokes itself up to put a disjunction in the conversation. Well, that's where the information is. It's like something went wrong. Something didn't work out. I'm not looking at the world properly or I don't know you well enough or as well as I thought. There's something there. And if I have any sense, I'm going to focus my attention on that. Like not obsessively or anything like that, but that's where all the information is. Because as long as what we're doing is working, then we both know enough already. As soon as what we're doing together isn't working, then that's instant evidence that there's something about us that needs to be updated. And you might think, well, that's a terrible thing. And the answer is yes, of course it is. It's a terrible thing. But it's also the thing, and this is the next stage of the development of this, let's call it universal morality. The universal morality might be found in the answer to the question, what should you do when you make a mistake? Now, one answer is catastrophic dissolution. That's, that's a collapse into chaos. No one is going to pick that voluntarily. <clears throat> let's put it that way. It's unbelievably unpleasant. Terribly anxiety provoking, shameful, and painful all at the same time. Worse, it can mean the absence of positive emotion. Because if you really collapse into chaos, not only are you overwhelmed by negative emotion, but the positive emotion system shut off. That's what happens to someone who's 
extraordinarily depressed and also hyper anxious at the same time. Not only are they suffering from an excess of negative emotion, but they've got no incentive movement forward whatsoever. That's not an optimal solution because it takes you out. The other possible, and so I would call that a nihilistic solution or a chaotic solution. It's not a solution, it's a dissolution. And you can think about it as a precursor to a potential solution, but it's very easy to get stuck there. And that's why Jonah could have stayed in the belly of the whale, along with all the other people that were eaten by the whale and never got back out. And you see people like that all the time. Their error has come along, blown out their frames of reference, they've collapsed into the underworld, into the chaotic underworld, and they don't know how to get out. They have post-traumatic stress disorder, or they're depressed, or they're hyper-anxious, or they're resentful and aggressive and destructive. Like, there's any number of states of being that can overwhelm you when the bottom has fallen out of your life. It's not an optimal solution, let's put it that way. That's a nihilistic solution, it's a collapse. The other solution is, we're talking, and I don't get what I want from you, and so I say, you better not do that again. I don't want to see that from you again. And so that's a tyrannical attitude, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my universe of order and its predictions, and I'm going to say, you go along with this, or I'm going to punish you. Now, there is a, an element in society, like society is made up of threats like that to some degree. It's an ineradicable part of society. That would be the tyrannical aspect of the Greek king, let's say. We've organized a set of punishments and threats that keep each of us in alignment. However, generally speaking, in a society that's functional, we've decided to adopt agreement with that set of principles more or less voluntarily. We say, well, you have rights and responsibilities, and I have rights and responsibilities, and I'm willing to pay a price for yours, including the acceptance of punishment if I transgress, but you're going to do the same for me. So there are intelligent ways that punishment and threat can be used and bounded. But it, that can easily degenerate into tyranny. And one of the methods that I can choose to use if I don't want to encounter error is just to enforce my will on everyone else. And I think when that happens personally and in the family and in the community and in the state all at the same time, then you get the emergence of a tyranny.